hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Midweek. I am Justin Patterson. I've got Mr. Dennis Cottrell here and we are going to continue something that we started last week and which is the, the question, as a Christian, can I lose my salvation? And so just a, a, how tonight's going to go, we've got a brief little recap and we're going to uh, talk about there are some scriptures that possibly hint or could be taken in the way that uh, a believer certainly could lose their salvation. So we're going to look at what some of those passages say, but then we're going to look and, and see uh, kind of what the, the role of the Holy Spirit in uh, eternal security, kind of what that looks like. Okay. So what we looked at last week was um, we asked the question, can I lose my salvation? Mm -hmm. That there are uh, at that point of salvation that uh, some, some things happen and I encourage you, if you missed last week, go back and watch that and then uh, pick it up here in part two. But certain things happen at salvation, but then there comes a point where I don't feel like I'm saved anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the works are not there. Um, and so we kind of get hung up. And so we tend to think that we can lose our salvation. But we looked scripturally that that doesn't hold water. That's right. It's uh, God gives us an assurance. He gives us promises. And those promises are based on Him and right. what He did on the cross. It's not based on us, but mm -hmm. it's based on Him. Mm -hmm. And and so we have to look at that and and let that be our focus primarily. Mm -hmm. What I find overall is that many times it's not so much what we feel about ourselves, but oftentimes we look at other Christians and we say this, how could that person be saved? and live like that or mm -hmm. do that? How could a person be saved, for example, and have an abortion? How right. could a person be saved and, and not be in church and going to uh, going hunting and missing church? And so we have a tendency to look at other people and criticize them. Right. And, we, and we say that. And then there are those times in our own life where we say, I can't believe a saved person would do that mm -hmm. and might even apply it to their own life. So we're, we're looking at these passages and, we're, and I think it's very interesting and challenging as we look at to them and, and, and try to pull out the truth of those passages. Absolutely. And, and one of the things uh, that you and I in this, this series that we've been doing is what we want to keep at the forefront of everybody's mind is what does the scripture say about the Lord? Mm -hmm. What does it say about him, his nature, his character, but also that's, that's primary, but also what, what is my role in all of this? Yes. And surprisingly, as we continue to go through this, our part is, is there is some part, but the Lord, especially the ministry of the Holy Spirit kind of overshadows mm -hmm. us in that. So we do have a, a part to play, but really, as, as we go through this study, what does this say about the Lord? And so kind of what is our response to that? So to kind of bring everybody up to speed, what, what we believe, what uh, Scripture says, and, and what the, the church here believes is that when someone truly professes Christ, mm -hmm. salvation in Christ, that that is locked in for uh, eternity. That is known as eternal security or the security of the believer. We believe that when someone truly confesses, they believe in their heart, confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he is resurrected, basically that he is who the Bible says he is. Yes. When we do that, we place our saving faith in him, that that is irrevocable. To use the, the verbiage of, of Paul, that cannot be taken away. So what we're going to look at tonight is passages that, that we've seen that seem to indicate that our salvation will be there, but then it can be taken away, whether it's through our actions or non-actions or inactions, I guess. Um, so we're going to look at some of those passages and we're going to kind of dispel some of those myths because it's kind of like a hologram. If you look at it from this way, it can be, it can look a certain way, but you look at it from this way, it looks like something yes. completely different. So some of yes. these passages we're going to look at here this evening. We're going to start in Philippians chapter two. Okay. Right. Well, let's let's uh, let's turn over to Philippians two, and, and uh, again, it's uh, it's a it's a great passage. Um, Paul is the human author of it, and this is one of the prison letters. And um, we're going to uh, let's see. Let's begin at what verse twelve. All right. Paul says this. He says, so then, my beloved, 
just as you have always obeyed, not always in, pres in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who's working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, when you see that, that passage, that statement, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, the best way I could describe it is he's talking about he has done a work in us, and now we ought to do the work out. It's, in other words, whatever he does in is the inward expression, but he wants and leads and provides the power to, to work out. So mm -hmm. what comes out is what has been in. Right. So it's not a matter of working in order to get mm -hmm. salvation. It's because it's what we already have. Right. Our salvation is already provided. Now mm -hmm. what do you do with it? Right. And, and at first glance, if, if you read that, um, like what Dennis said, to work out your own salvation, that means if we look at it from, from just a, I, I would say, a carnal standpoint, not understanding the, the true work of, of Christ, that it's up to me. It becomes my job to earn that salvation, my job to get into God's good graces, but that's not what it's talking about no. at all. You look at verse 13 where it says, for it is God who is working in you. Right. That's the key. You remember we talked about this a few weeks ago. We're being confident of this very thing that he that hath begun a good work in you will complete it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same book. Paul is saying that he is going to, that Christ is going to work out what he has worked in. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. And our role in this whole thing is to cooperate with the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. He provides the will. He provides the desire. Mm -hmm. He provides the uh, ability to do it. Right. The spiritual gifts that are there are, are all those mm -hmm. things that are uh, able. But it's not in a sense of us doing it so much as it him doing it in us right. to be expressed outwardly. Therefore, yep. when we do it that way, we don't take credit for it. Mm -hmm. It's something that he does. Yep. And we don't pat ourselves on the back for being obedient to mm -hmm. the Lord. What we realize is he is the, is the provider of that. Absolutely. And it starts with his grace being extended to us. We respond in faith, and that's what happens at salvation. And then that begins the work of the Holy Spirit yes. in us. Yes. And so yes. working out our salvation, our part is just simply believing yes. in acting in faith. And then the Holy Spirit begins to work in us, and those works begin to, they, they're an output of God's grace that they, is, that they is follow. us. Yeah. And, and it's not a matter of, of, there's never, salvation is never spoken of in a sense of without works. Works follow, but mm -hmm. they're the fruit of yeah. the belief. Yeah. And, and again, therefore, it's, it's a work of God in our lives that eventually manifests itself mm -hmm. through works outwardly. Right. And um, and so when you see somebody that's um, that's fallen by the wayside or stopped going to church or whatever, that if that person has genuinely been saved and if they've been born again, mm -hmm. God brings back those works. He brings mm -hmm. back those people. He 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 does those things within us. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a great promise and an yep. encouragement because sometimes we we really do. Uh, get sidetracked sometimes, and it's mm -hmm. good to be able to know that he can bring his home. Absolutely. So we're going to continue through, and, and what we're going to do for the next two uh, passages that we look at, we're going to be jumping over to the book of Hebrews. Uh, and the author of Hebrews, it's, it's important, I think, to understand context. When we look at Hebrews, we need to understand who the author is writing to and what is the context of all of these things, because you could take a verse or a, a short passage out of context and and make it something completely that it's not. So I think understanding the context of Hebrews is, is I would say, vital Absolutely. in understanding um, what is going on here. So just in a nutshell, you have Jews, uh, Jews and Christians who come from Judaism, mm -hmm. and they are hinting around, they're sniffing around Christianity, which is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. But what they're doing is they're kind of hanging out in the, let's call it the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. They're coming up, 
very close to this new covenant, God's grace, the work of Christ. They're wanting to participate, and some of them are, but others are kind of like, nope, I, I need to retreat to what is safe for me, which is the Old Testament, the Levitical law. So when we understand that the, the author of Hebrews is writing to those two groups of people, not just Christians who are uh, immersed in Jewish um, um, traditions, but also the Jews who are just about to make that leap of faith into um, the new covenant of, of God's grace. So that's a very, very oversimplified version, but that gives us the background, the understanding of knowing when we go into this text that that is what is going to be uh, talked about. So I want to pick this up in chapter 3, starting in verses 12 and 13. And so this, there is a lot that could be said, and we're going to have to, Dennis and I are going to have to kind of, um, kind of keep this uh, almost kind of, yeah, make it brief. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's look at Hebrews three twelve and 13. He says, take care, brothers and sisters, that there will not be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that look at these words, falls away from the living God, but encourage one another every day as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, we could spend the rest of our time talking about just this one verse, but I want to look at just two parts to that. The unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So again, we have those two groups of people. The Jewish people who we would consider Jews by ethnicity and by custom, but who are saved by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. So we call them, let's refer to them as Jewish Christians, but you also have other Jews who have not yet professed faith in Christ. Verse 12 is talking about those, that second group of people, those who have not yet been partakers because it says uh, that I pray, I take care that there will not be any of you an unbelieving heart that falls away. What are they falling away from? Is it they have placed saving faith in Christ and then fall away? No. It's them who have gotten close up to it, but then retreat back into what they, they know to be, what they consider to be the truth. But the second part to this is, uh, but encourage one another every day. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ, encourage one another every day so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that is referring to the heart of those who have placed faith in Christ. That although you know they are still doing the Jewish customs, they place their faith in Christ. But this right here, the, the deceitfulness of sin, to where they think that, okay, my sinfulness, my sin, my actions have now disqualified me from that grace. That's kind of what this passage is talking about. And we know that that is not the case. If you have that eternal security, it's yours. Now the deceitfulness of sin starts to creep in. And so there we see God's part has already been done, but now it becomes our part. You know, one of the one of the obvious things that happens here, think of the... Of the uh, Jewish, the the traditions of the Jewish people, it, the culture, the pressures of the family, the whole society. Whether whether these believers or people were in Italy or in Israel, the, what has happened is after they begin to hear the message of grace in Christ, mm -hmm. there is tremendous pressure placed upon those individuals to set Jesus aside and go back to the traditions. Right. Go back to the Levitical system of sacrificing, mm -hmm. uh, of being uh, in, in that sort of experience. And so for those people who profess but do not possess Christ, there's some of those people are going to go back having come, as you said, very close to a decision. Mm -hmm. But I also think there really was those situation where those are believers uh, at least it appeared to be believers, and then because of that uh, pressure from the culture and the society, mm -hmm. friends, family, 
that some of those people were tempted also to set aside Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, for believers, in fact, if you look at verse 14 of that same chapter, he says, For we have become partakers of Christ, and this is the issue, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that on, on first appearance, that looks like you can't, that you can be saved and then lose it. But the thing is, remember what we talked about last week, Christ holds on to us. Mm -hmm. And and yet what happens in our lives, we then, by the work of the Holy Spirit, we respond to that grace. Mm -hmm. And we find ourselves holding on ourselves in mm -hmm. a sense of what we believe. So the warning is, for those of us who are believers, mm -hmm is stay true to your to those things that are steadfast right we have the um, the stress is being placed upon us as believers to respond to the spirit of god he leads he provides the desire right he provides the strength through the work of the holy spirit mm -hmm. so cooperate with that right and what will happen is we will hold on mm -hmm. now i also believe that those those situations and i shared with you earlier I had experience when I was in uh, college. I was working in a work study program, and a man named Leo uh, was a Jewish believer. He is retired from the Navy, and, and we became friends. And so I began to share the Lord with him, and he was very open. And after several months of study, um, I finally came to him and I said, Leo, would you like to, uh, do you understand where I'm coming from that Jesus is the Messiah? And he said, you know, I really do. He said, I can understand where you're coming from. And, and he said, I see, I know what you're talking about. And I said, well, would you like to receive him? Mm -hmm. And Leo said, no, I can't do that because of my family and mm -hmm. because of all, all that I've been raised in. And he was in his mid-60s, actually. Well, so he, he, didn't, he didn't go any further with it. Mm -hmm. And it was, what a shame it was. He came right up to the very understanding and agreed mm -hmm. with it intellectually. Mm -hmm. But then he refused to accept Christ. Mm -hmm. And a few few weeks after that, I, I, I found that he had uh, died at the bottom of the pool. Mm -hmm. And and that's what he's talking about, where, they, where you come right up to that very edge. Right. But as believers, those of us who have trusted in Christ, then what we are to do is to be aware mm -hmm. that it's very possible to lose certain things. Now, mm -hmm. Justin, what do you, as a believer, what do we lose if we fall away in a sense of getting sidetracked or, or stumbling? What do we lose if we don't lose our salvation? Well, so at, at the end of, uh, was it 3.12 um, uh, or 13, that you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that's uh, Hebrews uh, 3.13. Sin is deceitful. And what sin does to our minds is it I said this before, it seems to disqualify us just in our minds, not according to God, but according to us. And so what we do is we, I don't know, unintentionally, we kind of put ourselves into timeout. And so if I am, you know, we're all going to sin all day, every day. That's, that's what, not all day, but we do that often. What, what we lose is we lose fellowship, first of all, with God. We take ourselves out of that fellowship and we kind of smack ourselves on our hands. So we don't feel that we are worthy because of our sinfulness to go back to God. But we know that we are supposed to repent, you know, turn away from whatever it is that we're doing. We all have stuff that we do to turn away from that and turn back to God. So that fellowship first and foremost with the Lord, but also fellowship with other believers, because I know you've heard this a lot, that there are some people that say, well, that if I go to church, everybody's going to know my sin. Well, no, people aren't like that. But we, we, that, that hinders us from coming to church mm -hmm. because we, we think that our sinfulness is keeping it keeping us from that. We feel guilty about it. Yeah, we feel guilty and we don't want to be condemned anymore by the Holy Spirit. And so what we, what we do is we separate ourselves. But more than that, we lose, uh, according to Galatians 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We don't see that as much. We don't have that, that joy, that peace, that yeah. loving kindness. We don't have that. 
But as David said in Psalm 51, one of my favorite Psalms, mm -hmm. restore to me the joy of your salvation. Yes. David said that. Yeah. So I, I can identify with that when, you know, yes. I get into a mess and, you know, it's like that, that is part of my prayer is Lord restore to me that joy. It's not a superficial happiness. It is a true Holy Spirit driven, Holy Spirit fruit producing joy. So we, we yeah. lose the fellowship and the joy and the peace and the blessings of the Christian life, but mm -hmm. we don't, we don't stop being a Christian. Right. We don't lose that salvation because right. that is irrevocable. That, that's right. That's yeah. something that God has done for us in us and it's a gift. Mm -hmm. And and so the emphasis in our Christian life should be cooperating with the Spirit of God within us right. to do the things that He wants. Mm -hmm. And when we stumble or when we do something dumb, His Holy Spirit reminds us of that. Mm -hmm. We lose that joy for a period of time mm -hmm. until we come back and get in, back into fellowship. Mm -hmm. But what a tragedy it is. Think about this. It's such a tragedy when believers been misinformed are ignorant of what God has provided for them, mm -hmm. and they live in this constant fear of losing their salvation. Yeah. Again, several years ago, I, I had a person that would come to the office, and I don't know, sometimes five or six times a week, and would call multiple times dur during the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, crying because they feared losing their salvation. Mm -hmm. The problem is that they're not focusing on God, they're focusing on their failures. Right, okay, yeah. And you can see how that would cause us to, to just be miserable. Yeah. And I hate to think about believers losing that joy yeah. Unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't we don't have to live that way because of the traditions of men. Yes. Not because of what what the Bible right. says. Absolutely. And there there is a a very major denomination that uh, teaches, for example, if you do a sin, sin X, and then you get hit by a bus without repenting or in some extreme cases, being water baptized, again, rebaptized. Um, if that happens and you go to be with the Lord, well, I shouldn't even you say die. that. Yeah, <laughs> if I die, yeah, then your salvation is in question. That is not what the Bible, the entire New Testament, that is not what it teaches. God's grace, again, is extended to us. We respond by faith. We take his word by faith. We have that eternal security. Now, that leads us to the, to the next part of this, is now that I have eternal security, I have my mm -hmm. golden ticket, you know, some people refer to it, my entrance into heaven, I have an eternity with the Lord. Now I can go and I'm good. I've got that check mark. Now I can go and kind of live however I want to. That we don't not, teach that from the scriptures. Nope, because and that's I, not what the scriptures say. It's not what the scriptures yeah. said. You can't find it in the scripture. The issue after we're born again is growing on to maturity. Mm -hmm. I want you to turn over to, to Hebrews 6. Mm -hmm. And in verse 1 of Hebrews 6, it's... The writer says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. Mm -hmm. Look on verse 9. But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and the things that accompany salvation. Mm -hmm. So what happens is we have to grow in Christ to fully enjoy the blessings of the Christian walk. Right. And as long as we're so hung up on the, the basic, the elementary things, mm -hmm. and not going on with Christ, we find ourselves vulnerable to being tossed to and fro. Some mm -hmm. preacher will say something from the pulpit or in the Bible, or a friend will say something to and all of a sudden you're questioning whether you've been saved or not. Right. If you've trusted in the blood of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. if you've come to him and you've responded in faith, you've confessed your sin, you've repented, you've turned to him, then you're saved. Mm -hmm. And now the issue is growing in the sense of those things that accompany salvation. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that, because when you look at, at the opening verses of, of verses 4 through 6, of Hebrews 6, mm -hmm. you're wondering, well, can I lose my salvation? Right. 
but it doesn't teach that. It, right. it teaches going on with Christ. Yeah, and, and that, that kind of bookends mm -hmm. probably the most famous passage that people use in terms of pointing out, see, you can lose your salvation. And so what we want to do is quickly kind of look at verses 4 through 6 of Hebrews 6. And this is out of the New American Standard Version. It says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now, Without understanding the context of Hebrews, one could look at that and say, okay, well, my salvation is conditional. And we're not talking about growth in Christ. We're just talking about salvation. That you can look at that and say, okay, well, you can easily fall away from Christianity. But again, I want to bring to mind the context of Hebrews. You have those who are tied to the old covenant, who practice the Levitical law, the keepers of the law, who are sniffing around this new covenant, the covenant of grace, they get right up to the edge, but then they don't do anything. So in other words, they have an intellectual understanding of God's grace through Christ. But then um, on the, the other group, you have those who have professed faith, that, that they are Jewish by uh, culture, Jewish by ethnicity, but they have moved on from the old covenant, understanding the new covenant of God's grace. So you have those two groups of people. What the writer of Hebrews is talking about is that uh, group of people who have, who have the intellectual but have not professed faith. So that way, when we look at verse number 6, uh, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, meaning they understand that, that Christ was physically crucified. They understand that on an intellectual level, but they have not professed faith. So what they do is they retreat back into what they, what they know. So when it says to fall away, that's not referring to apostasy, which is, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, professing faith in Christ, saving faith receiving the, the Holy Spirit and then changing your mind saying, no, that's not really for me. That would be apostasy. But that's not what this is talking about. When it says to fall away, it just means simply taking another path that they agree on an intellectual level, but not on a heart level. Yes. It, though, as we mentioned before, the whole book of Hebrews is emphasizing the superiority of Christ. Mm -hmm. The fact that whether you're Jew or somebody else, you should not go leave Christ and go back to something. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the emphasis is being Christ is the way. He is, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No mm -hmm. man cometh unto him but, but by faith. Uh -huh. and, and so the, the issue here is, again, these are things that accompany salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, look at verse 1 of chapter 6, leaving the elementary teachings. Let us press on to maturity, verse mm -hmm. 9. But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and the things that accompany salvation. The context are those things that accompany salvation. Mm -hmm. In other words, growth is what we're talking about. Right. And what God is doing in us, he's working in us, is to be worked out in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what the emphasis was. So many of the Hebrews, though, were returning back to, as you said, come up right to the point of professing. And that's what the context of Hebrews is about. Mm -hmm. So we must, as believers, you can't set Jesus aside and then and go on without him. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Absolutely. So we could spend a whole lot more time talking about uh, Hebrews chapter 6. There is a lot to this, but really we, we just want to kind of reiterate with everyone here that, that one cannot lose their salvation. If there truly is a Romans 10, 9, and 10 experience that you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and you believe in the resurrection, you will be saved. That is a, an irrevocable gift from the Lord. Now, the second part to that, that, that can never be taken away. What can be taken away are 
the the fruit of the Holy Spirit that he brings in our lives, things like fellowship and uh, joy and peace and, and things like that in our lives. So there is a, a ministry of the Holy Spirit, which in one of the, the upcoming weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about, is the role of the Holy Spirit in sanctification. The Holy Spirit is front and center in sanctification. And so we're going to look and see what Scripture says about that. But the, the point about salvation, even though there are Scriptures that seem to indicate that our salvation is conditional, the Bible teaches, the New Testament teaches that that gift is irrevocable. And so that is the security, the eternal security that you and I have as Christians. It's the other uh, stuff that we kind of put ourselves in time out, which we're going to talk about more next week. So this is each uh, week kind of builds upon one another, or yep. as the Bible says, precept upon precept. Okay. And so uh, we're going to continue through this. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave that in the comment section, or you can find one of us on Sunday. We invite you to come and be a part of Freedom Fellowship this coming Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We love you guys, and we will see you then. Thank you.